you want to leave me, but I refuse to let you go. If I have to beg and plead for your sympathy, I don't mind cause you mean that much to me. Ain't too proud to beg, sweet darling, please don't leave me, girl, don't you go. Ain't too proud to plead, baby, baby, please don't leave me, girl, don't you go. Yes, 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 yes. The power of music. Just like that, I started singing, you guys started clapping, and we all started, you know, joined in on that amazing tune. That song was written back in 1966, over 55 years ago, yet it still has a way of bringing us together. Music has a way of connecting us in our brightest moments when we graduate from school, go out on that first date. It also has a way of connecting us in our darkest moments when we lose a loved one or lose a job. Music helps us in those pivotal moments. It serves as that soundtrack. So why does music feel so useless today? Why are we not using music to cure the divides that's going on in our nation? I know I'm the only one standing on a red dot in this room, but you guys gotta feel me. Music is not bringing us together like it used to. Now, for my creatives, this is not a knock on the music that's being created, so don't think this is an anti-music speech. Don't kick me out of any cool jam sessions. This is about the power of togetherness, and that's allowing music to cure and heal our divide. You know, my first lesson with the power of togetherness I learned with my grandmother, Gladys Turner, when I was five years old. She taught me that lesson. At five, I was already a petty thief and a pathological liar. I know some of you can't believe it, right? Like, look at this smile. <laughs> no, I was. I was pretty good at it. I could go to the grocery store and steal like nobody's business. The first time she caught me, I had a really good lie. I told her I was taking a shopping cart back up to the store, and there was a lady passing out candy. She was very, very skeptical about that and said, hey, don't take, you know, candy from strangers. But of course, I was five, so you know I had to be slick again, right? So I tried it again. And this time, she took the shopping cart back. So show of hands, how many of you guys like fun dipsticks? Anybody? I was risking it all for it. <laughs> So I tried it again, of course, and she said, well, where did you find it? I said, I found it on the ground. She said, okay, well, empty your pockets. I had the grape flavor, I had the red flavor, apple flavor, I had them all. But what she did next was very interesting. She didn't condone my behavior. We loaded back up in the car, and we went back up to the grocery store. And of course, the store tried to downplay it. It's no big deal, he's a little kid. They just didn't want to admit that I you know, got the candy from him. But you know, she paid for the items that I opened, and she returned the other items. And we went back in the car, and we drove home. And she was very calm, very nurturing. She didn't run up her blood pressure. But y'all know that expression, I'm gonna whoop you like you stole something. <laughs> <laughs> and there I am, I'm crying in, you know, in between Bill Withers singing. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. Only darkness every day. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone, and she's always gone too long. Anytime she goes away. And I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, I'm getting beat just like that with the chancla's whip. You know how that go. I know, I know. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. <laughs> you see how music brought us together? <laughs> Two things never happened again. I never stole, and I never lied to my grandmother again. And it wasn't about the humiliation of having to take the candy back to the store or the spanking that ensued. She mastered the reflection piece. She had a little wooden chair I'd have to sit in, and I'd spend 15 to 20 minutes sitting in that chair thinking about my actions. And she didn't allow excuses such as my papa being a rolling stone or my mom being away at service to be a reason for my behavior. She let me know that she had my back, and we were in it together. And that meant something to me at five years old. That was my first lesson with the power of togetherness. That was a defining moment that changed my life forever. So imagine, for 10 seconds, just close your eyes and just imagine, what was your defining moment? Who, what, when, where? Who was that person that stood up for you and changed the path that you were on in your life? Now open your eyes. Hopefully, each of you have had somebody who's cared enough about you to help you get to where you are today. Yeah, 
Imagine. You know, John Lennon wrote a famous song titled Imagine. And the lyrics that always stand out to me in that record is he says, you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you will join us and the world will live as one. What does that mean to you? To me, it means everything. Building relationships with people that don't look, think, or act like you do. Diversity and inclusion for all people together. It's ironic. I got discovered aboard a bus with his namesake, the John Lennon Educational Tour Bus, along with five other individuals. We signed a record deal with Columbia Records. We had a reality TV show on BET. And I got to live my dream, the rock star life. But for me, it almost didn't happen. A lot had to go into that. I turned down scholarships to go to college. I moved back home to Columbus, Ohio, and started pursuing a musical career with other musical entrepreneurs. That's just a fancy word for saying I worked at Best Buy and I was that guy singing in the speaker room trying to sell you CDs. <laughs> <laughs> but I met a guy along the, in the process, a producer, and we started working together. We started collaborating. And back then, he said he knew a guy that could get us free studio time. So I'm like, oh, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. And so we banded together. And you know, if y'all remember, we had those old brick phones, right? And if you really were fancy, you had a flip phone. And our minutes didn't kick in until after 9 p.m., nights and weekends. Y'all remember that? For you youngins in here, y'all don't know the struggle. Y'all have no idea. So he was talking to this guy all during the day. So I'm like, OK, this is really happening. He's wasting precious minutes. This is really going on. So we get to the studio, find out he's not there. Imagine my surprise when I find out not only is he not there, he's not in the United States. He's in South America and Brazil. So I, immediately, I'm like flustered. And I'm thinking to myself, man, he's a bigger liar than I am. <laughs> but on top of that, I'm sitting here wondering what's next. Another defining moment happened. There's a little inner city youth program, a fine arts program below downstairs. There's a gentleman by the name of Clifton Hardy in there. And he had one person that just declined to go on this bus. They need one other person. And so my friend redeems himself. He's like, oh, I know a guy. He can sing and write. And so I go in there, and I sing, and you know, I get that opportunity for a room full of folks just like yourself. But I always think about my mindset. What if I had enough song? What if I had a bad attitude and left? I would have never gotten that opportunity. I got to work with five amazing individuals, singing, writing, producing, dancing, you name it. We were about 100 songs in before we finally landed on a group name. And I know you're all dying to know. We chose Fatty Coo. It's OK. Yeah, it was between that and serendipity. I don't know why it was between that and serendipity, <laughs> but that's what it was. But you know, the group name didn't matter to us. What mattered to us was a chance at an end, a means to an end, a chance at survival, living out our dreams and doing what we were destined to do. And we got to do that together. But enough about me. Tragedy is what typically brings us together when I think of music and coming together. Case in point, how many of you guys remember when Biggie and Tupac had their beef, right? You were either on the East Coast with Biggie Smalls or you were on the West Coast with Tupac. There was no middle ground, no plan of fence. It's a lot like the goat talk you hear in a barbershop with Michael Jordan and LeBron James. I'm not gonna answer who I think's the best, but LeBron did have the better Space Jam, I'm just saying, all right? <laughs> he did if you watched it. But it didn't matter, in all seriousness, it didn't matter to us. What mattered at the end of the day is that their music brought us together, and we learned to appreciate their music. Selena, I knew exactly where I was the day she died. March 31st, 1995, I was 10 years old, school had just let out, and we didn't have cell phones, but the news spread like wildfire. Everybody knew, everybody was impacted. Look what she did, she changed the game. She was so iconic, she changed the game for Latino women, the perception people had in the songs. Bitty Bitty Bum Bum, Como La Flor, my all-time favorite, Dreaming of You, absolutely priceless. Now, they wanted me to sing some Selena, but y'all don't want to hear my slinging voice, all right? I'm just <laughs> letting y'all know. No, I, I can't do it. <laughs> Nipsey Hussle. You know, he died 24 years to the day, March 31st, 2019. And this hit different for me. It hit different because I knew him personally. I actually had the opportunity of working with him at the beginning of his marathon. and was honored to call him my friend. It hit different because... I had those conversations with him and knew what he was trying to accomplish and watched him accomplish all those dreams. He didn't forget about where he came from. He made his millions and he was still inspiring so excellence to so many other young African-American kids or just kids of all cultures. 
and he didn't forget where he came from. Slauson and Crenshaw. Everybody knew. So for him to lose his life, not only in that same neighborhood, but in that same block that he hustled in his early youth, it was tragic. And I always think of his lyrics. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Won a slice, got to roll the dice, that's why. All my life, I've been grinding all my life. Yeah. Tupac, Biggie, Selena, Nipsey, they all died in their prime well before their time. All legends, all icons, all trying to change the game, all brought people together, different races and cultures. But look at the, over the last 18 months, what have we seen with the pandemic and everything that's going on? The Black Lives Matter movement versus police brutality. Republicans versus Democrats. People with masks versus pe people with no mask. People with vaccine shots versus people with no vaccine shots. The people with toilet paper versus people without toilet paper. <laughs> division, that's all we've seen over the last 18 months is division. So my question to you, what are we planning on doing about it? We can no longer remain idle. We can no longer sit on the sidelines and, and just root and spectate. We have to get in the game. TikTok videos are cool for my younger generation, it's cool. Tweeting is okay, 140 characters, 280, I guess they've increased it, that's okay. But it's not sustainable. Music, the power of music, let's create, it heals. Healthy debate is a gift, let's communicate. Let's find ways to work with each other. And above all, let's listen, let's listen. The power is within us. Together, we can cure the divide. And like my man John Lennon said, You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you will join us and the world will live as one. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank <laughs> you.